Bespoke Radio for the Masses. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. I need your help to get to the year 1985. Listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Good evening. Fade to Black. Bespoke Radio for the Masses. Yeah, man. How you doing? How you doing? Today is Monday, May 4th, 2020. One hundred and twenty-five days into the new year, only two hundred and forty-one days left. And may the fourth be with you. Happy Star Wars Day, everybody. Night. We are live from a bunker somewhere in the middle of beautiful downtown Burbank, California. And I would like to welcome everybody listening all around the world, all across the United States. Hither and thither, to and fro, back and forth, up and down, east and west, north and south, far and near. This is Fade to Black for KJCR, the Game Changer Network, and KGRA, the Planets. I'm yours, Jimmy Church. What is cracking, everybody? How you doing? Yeah, man. You know, you know this this planet is a great place when you have Star Wars Day. Yeah, man. Got a great week here on Fade to Black, and uh, Rita and I were just talking before the show, and the next three weeks. Uh, for Fade to Black uh, are just going to be amazing. And I, I I just can't believe what's coming up. And just looking at this week, it's a perfect example of why this show is so much fun to do. Because tonight, very special guest and kicking off the week, Whitley Strieber is here. And man, oh man, what a show we have got lined up for tonight. And then tomorrow night, right here on this program, Johnny Enoch joins us. And Johnny is going to be talking about his recent trip to Egypt and then to the UK and then came home. And what happened in Egypt and the UK before he came home. That's all tomorrow night. You get ready for that. It's going to be really cool. And then Wednesday night, Nick Redfern. Nick Redfern has got a new book out, The Rendlesham Forest UFO Conspiracy. And I posted today, and I mean this, Nick likes to Nick, Nick, Nick likes to stir the pot. Let's just say that. And for him, it's fun, it's sport, it's a way of life, it's what he does, and we love it. And that is Wednesday night. I cannot wait to cover this. So that'll be Wednesday. Thursday night's another fader night with open lines all night long. Right now, you can follow me on Twitter at J Church Radio. All right? You can kick it off right there. Start your fade to black involvement, your participation as a fader night. You, you can start right there. Follow me on Twitter at J Church Radio. All right? And then after you take that first step, Hashtag F2B. Everything that you post, hashtag F2B. That is the sandbox. 
And somebody just posted in Twitter, in the sandbox, a Millennium Falcon guitar. I have seen these pop up over the years. Oh, this is a bass. That's a Millennium Falcon bass. I've seen this more than once, and uh, it's very cool. It is very cool. I think uh, I think a TIE Fighter guitar would be pretty cool, too, as well. No, not a TIE Fighter. What? Uh, X-Wing. The X-Wing. The X-Wing is Luke, right? That's that's Luke. You can... <laughs> TIE Fighter is... Yeah, that's that's this one. No, uh, X-Wing. Yeah, the X-Wing. That'd be a cool guitar. I don't think it'd be as cool as the Millennium Falcon, but the Millennium Falcon has been done. That looks good, though. Man, that's a that's a cool looking uh, cool looking bass guitar, right there. Okay, and then hashtag <clears throat> excuse me, hashtag F two B Q is fade to black questions. You can also email throughout the show, Jimmy at JimmyChurchRadio.com. dot com. All right. I keep everything up and live. We've got the chat rooms open over at Spreaker and KGRA. Of course, everybody over on Facebook and Twitter Live and YouTube. You guys are just chatting and commenting away. Hello to everybody that's out there. Uh, Okay, I guess the old bunker cam is gone. That I don't know. The bunker cam should be up and running. So I, I don't pay attention to all of that. That's uh, other people in the background, but uh, Rita, if you're monitoring Twitter, what are they talking about there? I'm already looking at pictures of the studio. What do you mean? The bunker cam is gone. I'm looking at it right here. So I don't know. I don't know what that's about. The old bunker cam? I'm not sure what that means. Do we have a new camera? Uh, That I don't know. No, that's... I have multiple cameras in front of me is it this one no it's this one right is it this one i don't know i don't know which one's running i don't know maybe we're running the wrong camera i don't know i don't know okay let's move on let's move on get your immune system boosted people you've got to do this now it's time to visit get the t.com and go and visit their special page. Click on the banner over at jimmychurchradio.com. Use the promo code FADER, F-A-D-E-R, and you will get free shipping on all orders over $50. And while you are over at uh, jimmychurchradio.com, click on the banner for Billy Carson's new internet TV network, ForbiddenKnowledge.tv, right? And when you go and visit, you will get and sign up three days free trial. Right there at ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. And River Moon Coffee, uh, their new Amazon store. We're doing some things. Um, I will let you know. But they're actually very, very cool uh, with River Moon Coffee and the Amazon page. And and and, and thanks. So I'll announce that uh, in, in about a week or two. But it's really cool. Use the promo code JimmyRMC over at Amazon. Use the promo code Fade uh, F2B blend F2B blend over at rivermooncoffee.com and go and check out our new blend. It's called Game Changer. Fade to Black Blend, this stuff right here that I'm drinking, Fade to Black Blend, the dark coffee is, of course, still there. We've just added another and it's called Game Changer. Let's get to the breaking news. A landslide left a dozen people displaced after their homes came dangerously close to being destroyed. All of this happened in New York, in Waterford. And these pictures that are all over the net show this one home dangling off the edge of a cliff. Right? And other homes are just feet away. Initially, seven homes were evacuated. But after engineers inspected the area, that number was reduced to three. The number shall be three. The cause of the landslide is unknown, but the area used to be a gravel pit. That's right. Archaeologists have unearthed the remains of a Bronze Age chieftain buried with profound wealth. Instead of receiving just one cattle head and hoof, right? And that's the normal offerage in his grave. A prize item reserved for VIP burials of that age, this chieftain 
had four such offerings. That's right, forehead and hoof. Archaeologists found the burials ahead of the construction of a skate park in southwestern uh, county of Glouch, uh, Glouch, uh, Gloucestershire, England. Radiocarbon dating revealed that the two men lived in about 2200 B.C. Head and hoof. That should be the name of a bar, right? What are you guys doing tonight? Going to the Head and Hoof? Oh, man, I haven't been to the Head and Hoof in a while. Yeah, let's go check out the Head and Hoof. Well, later on this month, the first flight of NASA astronauts from U.S. soil in nearly nine years is about to happen. The mission will launch astronauts Bob Benkin and Doug Hurley to the International Space Station on a SpaceX Crew Dragon spacecraft in a final test flight for NASA. That's right. Got to do a test flight with people eventually. The mission, Demo 2, will mark NASA's first crew launch from American soil since the agency's space shuttle fleet retired Back in July of 2011, liftoff is set for 4.32 p.m. in the middle of the afternoon Eastern Time from the historic launch pad 39A, the same site used for NASA's Apollo and shuttle missions at NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida. And this is all going down on Wednesday, May 27th. And we are all going to watch that live on TV. This is exciting. This is like this is like going back to Apollo. This is this is the real deal stuff finally happening right here in the good old United States of America. Now, the Star Wars UFOs and Artificial Intelligence Conference is going down November 5th through the 8th. We've got lots of cool things that we are going to be doing there. I'm going to be there. Rita's going to be there. The Fade to Black crew is going to be there. Grant Cameron's going to be there. Paul Heinrich's going to be there. James Fox is going to be there. Alan Stivelman, Sid Goldberg, and another dozen great speakers. All right? Now, I'm going to be hosting, and I'm going to be doing some talking. So, tickets and info, visit StarWorksUSA.com. Yeah, the links are over at JimmyTurnsRadio.com. Very excited about Disclosure Fest. Now, uh, it has a new date, which is August 8th, which is a Saturday here in Los Angeles at the historic Los Angeles Park right there in downtown. Okay, visit DisclosureFest.org for all of your information and updates. And tomorrow, I believe it is tomorrow. Are you ready? I'm going to be hosting the Disclosure Fest live stream with Stephen Greer. This is our part two. So we're going to have a chat tomorrow, and then Stephen is going to lead us all on a meditation. So that is going down tomorrow, and we'll have the links up for that. And you know what? I'm going to make a, a little advance announcement because we officially haven't gotten it up there on the web and things, but uh, we'll do it over the ne next couple of days. Next week, a week from today on Monday, I will be hosting, and we're going to do a simulcast of The Conjuring House, who the new owners are in lockdown, like the rest of us, stay-at-home orders. So, a seven-day paranormal lockdown. And next Monday night, I am going to be hosting and talking to the family for a couple of hours, and it's going to be simulcast. I'll be live on TV as well as here on Fade to Black. How cool is that? So that'll be next Monday. Like I said, these next three weeks on Fade to Black are just going to be amazing, and uh, get ready for all of that. Let's get the show cracking. Happy birthday to today. One of my favorites, Will Arnett. Today, 50 years old. Let's go to prison. Hot Rod. The Rocker, right? He's also Batman. In the Lego movies. I bet you didn't know that. Green Day bassist Mike Durnt today is 48. Guy's a real bass player, by the way. Jazz bass living icon Ron Carter today is 82. Of course, Miles Davis, Blue Note Records, right? His appearances on 2,221 recording sessions 
make him the most recorded jazz bassist in history. Ron Carter, today, 82 years old. Motley Crue's Mick Mars, today, 69 years old. That's right. And in sync's Lance Bass. <laughs> I said it. Today is 41 years old. Lance will always make the birthday list because of Tropic Thunder. Our dead guy's birthday today is Dick Dale. 1937 to 2019, died at the age of 81. Dale was known as the king of the surf guitar. His song, Miser Lou, was used by Quentin Tarantino in Pulp Fiction. Now, Miser Lou, due to the suffix oo, right, is the feminine Greek form of miserless or Egypt. Therefore, the song is about an Egyptian woman. Now, think about Uma Thurman's haircut. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. There you go. On this day in history, 1970, National Guardsmen fire fire their weapons at a group of anti-war demonstrators on the Kent State University campus, killing four students, wounding eight, and permanently paralyzing another. Yeah, sad day in American history. Game changer. Fader fact. In 1859, Thomas Austin. Now, this is for everybody in Australia, in the land down under. This is for you. In 1859, Thomas Austin released 24 rabbits for hunting into the wild in Australia. That's right. A country which, at that time had no native rabbit population. By 1920, 60 years later, their population increased to 10 billion. This is the fastest spread ever recorded of any mammal. And that, (laughs) they haven't stopped since. And that is your fader fact. I wonder if there's a Thomas Austin national holiday in australia there you go let the tweets fly from all of our friends in australia that's a crazy fader fact right there all right where am i at uh tonight whitley streber is here is going to be with us at the bottom of the hour and i'm really looking forward to this conversation tonight so get ready for that but first let me hit this river moon coffee rivermooncoffee.com fade to black blend best coffee in the world Man, that's good coffee. Okay. After all of this is over, this virus crisis, can you imagine what air travel is going to be like? Think about that for a second. I don't think that the changes are going to be of the good variety. Now, here's the thing. If you are old enough to remember, okay, if you are old enough to remember flying back in the day, and I'm talking about the 60s through the (laughs) mid-90s, right? And remember, man, the mid-90s, the night, you know, that's uh, 25 years ago. (laughs) It's crazy. You know how great it was, right? You do. I remember, and the memories are good. Back then, it was all about the passenger, the flyer. Every single thing that could or would make your travel better was attended to. All of it. Flying made you feel special. You see, every airline was going to make you special, regal, and appreciated. Sure, it was the food, it was the drink, it was the questions. Are you are you are you okay? Are you is there anything I can do? Is it, it was the pillow, it was the smoking. Actually, it was a friggin' party at thirty thousand feet, and it was a party that was thrown just for you. And you knew this. It was great. Love flying. I remember I was flying home uh, to Indy back in nineteen eighty five. And I was traveling with my new flame guitar, which is hanging up uh, over there with some other 
some other guitars. It's hanging up over there. And uh, uh, I was flying home with that guitar, and it was just built by Neil Moser. It was fresh. He had just finished it, and I wanted to show it to my family and friends. Now, I wasn't going to check it in as baggage. No, you're not going to do that with a guitar like that. So I planned on just carrying it onto the plane and get it into the overhead compartment somehow in the back. That was my plan. Anyway, as I walked up to the door of the plane with my long hair, you know, full of Aquanet, the flight attendant says to me, what is that? And I said, hey, this is a new custom guitar. You want to see it? She said, sure. So I put the guitar on the ground. I opened up the case. And she continued with like, wow, that is beautiful. And then she says, if you want, I can put it in first class for you where it'll be safe with me and you can pick it up when we land. I was like, wow, thank you so much. That is so nice. She literally took the guitar case and put it in the first class a class coat closet, which is right there next to her seat and said, it's safe. There it is. She closed the door. I said, oh, wow. So go have the flight and, and what happened. Now, imagine, I mean, she was so nice. You know, she cared. It wasn't an act. Now, imagine this happening today. You can't because it would never happen today. I remember, I remember the, the end of the good old days of flying. I do. I remember it like it was yesterday. I had a travel agent. Her name was Carol, who handled everything for me when I was flying on business throughout the 90s. She was great. And when, when I was getting my account set up with her as a client, she had me fill out a bunch of paperwork, and one of them was a preference form, you know, a thing about me. And it had, like, favorite and preferred foods and drinks and, you know, aisle or window seats. You want the front of the back of the plane, right? Do you normally have checked on or carry on luggage or both? And on this form, I wrote seafood for meals. I wrote fresh coffee and Perrier for drinks. And and then I had a breakfast section, had a lunch section, and I even wrote scrambled egg, sausage, and bacon for breakfast. I did. Seriously, these were actual questions. Now, on my first business flight with the Carol that she booked for me, as the flight attendant comes down the aisle asking everyone, chicken or beef, chicken or beef, chicken or beef, they skipped me. Right? And I, I didn't think anything about it at the time. But when the food was delivered, there was a fresh salad with shrimp on the top and my name written on a label. And I was like, wow, Mr. Church, right? This service happened on every flight for a few years. And I really got used to it. I'm telling you, I flew in the morning, man, scrambled eggs, bacon, sausage. <laughs> it, was, it was nuts. Perrier, you know, and uh, flight attendants would come by and here's your fresh coffee, Mr. Church. Wow. Wow. This is great. Well, I loved flying. I did. Then Southwest happened. Screwed it up for everybody. And then you can follow that with the Unabomber. Because at that time in 1996, and I, I, to the day, I remember when everything changed, right? I was on a plane every single week. I, I, I know what was going on out there. Everything was great until a flight from Sacramento back to Los Angeles. At the gate in Sacramento, right, waiting for it, waiting to board the plane, some feds show up, badges and Cops and it, it, they literally walk in to the seating area at the gate 
and started to walk up to people asking them to search their carry-on luggage. And I'm watching this go down. I'm 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 on this side. I see it see it going down over here. And some people were absolutely horrified just to have them open up their bags. And just imagine being surprised about this. It's one thing today you expect it. Imagine that. Just walk up, open your bags, right? Everyone was getting really uncomfortable, and the agent started to say things like, if I can't search your carry-on, you're going to have to book another flight. And I nearly lost it uh, in anger. I, I, man, it was getting ugly. Now, when they came up to me, I was a different person. I caved. I did. No anger. I wasn't going to show anything. I needed to get on this flight. I even unzipped my bag for him, you know, and they went through my computer case as well. And I was, I just felt so violated. And then a couple of days later, I was flying from LA to New York nonstop out of LAX and, and I'm on this flight and the flight attendant comes up to me and says, chicken or beef? I was like, what? Chicken or beef? Chicken. And I thought to myself, they must have lost my name somewhere. (laughs) Check with Carol tomorrow. You know, get to the bottom of this. So the next day, I called her and I said, hey, Carol, they forgot to give me my seafood salad. Right? And her reply was, she's like, "Uh, Jimmy, there's some changes happening with air travel. No more special menu requests. And in fact, soon... There's going to be no more food. I was like, oh, what? 1996 was the last year of real air travel. Five years later, 9-11 happened, and that took things to a new level. You know, and with the Unabomber and TSA and searches and all of that, combined with the downsizing and budget cuts in the airline industry, and then 9-11 happened, and and when 9-11 happened, that broke through to a level, uh, right through the floor to a place that we just didn't know anything about, right? But today, most of us are used to the absolute no-frills airline industry and the draconian TSA lines, shoe removal, body scans. Airports and flights have been reduced to nothingness. Nothing matters. Not you, not your luggage, not the experience. The flight attendants, they don't want to be there. The workers at the airport, they don't want to be there. The pilots are nothing special anymore. You remember how they had that? They had God status. Well, today, they're treated like first-time McDonald employees working part-time during summer vacation from school. So you have to ask yourself, how can it get any worse? Just wait. You'll see. You'll see. There won't be anybody greeting you at the plane's door, you know, saying, how are you today? Everything okay? Let me take that extra precious special guitar and put it in first class where it'll be safe. Nope, not going to hear it. And maybe this will be the chance for the entire airline industry to change, to roll back to the times when flying was special. And they may have to do it, right? They're going to have to do it to win our hearts back and our wallets. There you go. Anything is possible, right? This is Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, Whitley Streber is here. This is Fade to Black on the Game Changer Network and KGRA, the planet. You can follow me on Twitter at J Church Radio. You can follow Whitley at Whitley Streber. We've got that up in Twitter on the Game Changer Network and KGRA. The planets. Email is Jimmy at JimmyChurchRadio.com. I'll be right back with our guest, Whitley Streber, after this short break. Stay with us. Welcome back. Fade to Black, I am your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, Whitley Streber is here. Tomorrow night, Johnny Enoch. Wednesday night, Nick Redfern. Thursday night, another Fader night with open lines all night long. What a great week in 
Whitley is here tonight to kick things off, and we are going to discuss his recent communication with the visitors and their message to all of us right here on planet Earth. Of course, Whitley is the author of the communion series of books and his latest book, released last year, A New World. And as science advances, we are finding that the universe is far larger and more complex than we ever imagined. And mysterious beings like our visitors, which uh, was dismissed by many, are turning out to be real. This is a calling to all of us to find a new life, a new world in which they play a part. Whit, uh, not only was Whitley the author of the communion series and many novels, uh, ranging from Wolfen and The Hunger to The Greys and the Alien Hunter series, Communion, The Wolfen, The Hunger, and Superstorm have all been made into movies. And Superstorm, of course, was The Day After Tomorrow. His websites are unknowncountry.com and streber.com. The links are over at jimmychurchradio.com. You can click on those. I would like to welcome back to Fade to Black, Whitley Streber. <laughs> I just love saying Whitley Streber. Whitley, good evening, man. How are <laughs> sort of you? Sort like Gobekli, in a way. <laughs> yeah, it is. It yeah. is. It is. It is. Yeah, you like that rhythm in the in the words. Uh, yeah, it's good to be back, Jimmy. I'm very wish it was happier times, but I'm still glad to be here, and I'm glad everyone's here too. Well, as I sign off, maybe after a couple of uh, broadcasts, instead of saying "Go Beckley Tappy," I'll just say "Whitley Streber." So there you that go. That would be fun. I, I That's okay. It. You can I'll, go ahead and do that. <laughs> I'll do that. I'll do that. <laughs> and um, Whitley, uh, in my opening rant tonight, uh, and I only say this because you and I are are from another generation um than uh, you know a large part of this audience is much younger already than, yeah i know Shoot. i know i know i know i know i know <laughs> it's scary but it's uh it's it's this whitley um uh air travel you uh through the you you've experienced just like i have each uh decade of air travel and I have. and it's degradation but up until the mid '90s, air travel was special, wasn't it? it? You felt, oh yeah, you were at another level, right? It's not that way anymore. <laughs> no, I, listen, I, I listen. I grew up in the '50s, and my dad was a big fan of air travel, and he took me everywhere he went. He loved to take his boy with him, and so I flew all over the place with my father back in the in the days. When airplanes were noisier, more bumpy, more comfortable, more special, and more dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> all of the above. And, yeah, and all of the above. Yeah, and flying was an event, right? You, your hair was combed, you oh, dressed you, up. You, yeah. Little boy had on a little tie and sh- suit, just like his daddy. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It was a big deal. It's... And, you know, it, 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 you, we think back and you always see the pictures of the food on the long haul flights. But the actual truth was that on a short haul flight, you'd get basically a sandwich and coffee or something like pretty much like you do a little more than you do now, but not all that much. The heyday of it actually was in the 70s. And then they, they, there was still a lot of airline competition, uh, the uh, uh they were subsidized so they could afford to 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 uh they could afford to r- compete with each other other over what you got and there was even one airline that was like cooking steaks in the air yeah I remember that i yeah, i do capital I, airways or something yeah i said to ann you know somehow or another i don't want to be in an airplane where they're grilling steaks in the back i'd rather not be grilled myself, you know. <laughs> I, I remember that whole ad campaign with uh, the right. grilled steaks. I, I totally remember that. I um I was old enough in right in the middle of the seventies. Uh, I did some flying by myself. I had to fly to and from uh, Central America uh, many times, and and well, when you well, that's a big yeah, deal, and yeah, those, you were a kid. Then. Yeah, I was fifteen. Yeah, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen yeah, years old. I, yeah, I flew all over when I was a kid too. Yeah, and it was it was so much fun, you know, and you just yeah. felt like you were part of a monarchy, you know, and right. I mean, it was really fun. And in, in in the sixties, I flew a lot. I flew mostly with my dad when I was a little boy. But then in the sixties, I flew a lot by myself, and it was special. It was really very special. And now today, if you get a bag of peanuts and a cup of water, 
You you, you, <laughs> you think you won? You're grateful. <laughs> You're grateful. Uh, real peanuts. I can't I can't eat them, of course, now because I'm allergic to them, but. They're still real. No, I'm I'm actually not allergic to them. I'm joking, but a lot of people are now. Yeah, and it's uh, and and le- this is a good lead-in. There's always a method to my madness, Whitley, and you're used to oh, that by now. Oh, we know this, Jimmy. Yes, we listen yes. to you. And it, it, which is this? Uh, this planet uh, is going through changes right now. We're going to be discussing that throughout the show tonight, but. Um, part of this global change in front of us, and we're all wondering how it's going to play out in the end, is the airline industry. That's a perfect example of that. When things fire up again, uh, what's what? What is air travel? Can it get worse? Right? I mean, can they can they take it take this down a notch, or is this an opportunity for the airline industry to go? You know what? Uh, we appreciate your business. And we're going to go the other way. We're going to kick things up, and and we're going to make flying special. I, is this well, an opportunity? You know, I think that it depends on the top management of the airlines. JetBlue is probably going to go down that road. Uh, Delta will go down that road. I'm not so sure about United, and I'm fairly sure that uh, Americans going to put in benches and pews if they can. Right. <laughs> benches and pews. Oh, man. Uh, I love the way your mind works. And we were we were uh, scheduled. We're going to do it next year now. It's been moved. Uh, we were scheduled to go over to the U.K. this month and uh, next month, this month, next month uh, for a conference over there. And I was looking forward to flying on British Air, right, to get that, to see if the experience was going to be different. And that, within, that, would our... be, that would be definitely something you should think carefully about. Really? <laughs> oh yeah, uh, Virgin's probably going to go under. Yeah, that's but, right. That's right. But uh, Virgin was much better than British Air in recent years. Yeah, I couldn't get direct flights uh, going into Manchester with uh, Virgin. Uh, direct flights coming back out, but nothing going uh, in. You know, you know how it is. It's just so strange. Yeah. But is this an opportunity uh, for everybody? And I'm talking when I say everybody, I mean everybody on this planet. Um, from the very tops of politics and geopolitics and state actors all the way down to people like you and myself. Is this an opportunity for everybody to uh, take a collective uh, stance on, on what we have been doing in the past versus the future and and maybe make some changes? We need to look at ourselves in a new way. There's no question about that. We, we, we are social creatures, and that means we have two choices. We either are going to split off into small tribal groups of various kinds, countries, cities, towns, different ideologies and political beliefs, etc., or we're going to see our, begin to see ourselves as a very large social group called humanity. And right now, it's becoming fairly clear that if we don't start to see ourselves as part of a bigger picture, we're in trouble. We, we cannot do this. Uh, we have to, everyone has to realize that they're not alone. Like this virus spreading like wildfire around the world is because we really are that big group already. We just play like we're not, we play like, well, I'm from such and such a state, and therefore we don't have much coronavirus, so the state next door is full of it, and uh, that's their problem. But it's not. I don't see any wall between those two states, or and it's the same way with countries. We're all in this together, with especially with a pandemic, God knows, and the, and the economic catastrophe that is on its way as well. Yeah, and and, and that's going to be amazing. And it already is terrible, but it is going to be unlike anything any of us have ever known in our lives, and it will be unlike anything in our history. And in that, I include include the Great Depression. And I don't mean it's going to be a worse version of that. I mean it's going to be very different from everything. And this is uh, uh, another way to look at it. We know it's coming. Right, uh, the Great Depression that was uh, sudden, 
right? Uh, there, there were right. certain aspects. 2008 and what happened then, sudden. A natural disaster, sudden. You know, these are things that just occur very quickly. This time around, we've, we've made all the forecasting. We know. We see the news reports. We know what's coming, and we're able to brace for it. And th- I think that's a, that's a big difference uh, this time around, not only emotionally, but uh, the, the way that we, wheel, that we will deal with it with the logistics side. Right. Well, we, we have to deal with the logistics side on an international basis. Like right now, the virus is beginning to really spread in India, Russia, and Brazil. And none of these countries are able to handle it. None of them, Russia included. Russia is basically a third world country with a couple of first world cities tacked on, St. Petersburg and Moscow. And uh, India, most people in India live in a single room, and most families have, uh, the average family is five members, the average home is one room. And, you know, if a, something like this gets out of hand in a place like that, that's, that's going to be an extraordinary human catastrophe. And the, in Brazil right now, it's, it, Brazil is a little wealthier country than India per capita. But it's still spreading very rapidly because something like 80 percent of them, a very high percentage of the Brazilian population live below the poverty level. And the definition of poverty is unbelievably low mm-hmm. in those countries. Mm-hmm. You know, we, the, a person who's living at, at the U.S. definition of the poverty level would be rich in many countries of the world. Now, how does uh, this very tangible uh, paradigm shift, because we all know it, not only from an economic standpoint, but from uh, a realization that you mentioned this earlier, there are no borders, right? We are all in this together right now. This is a global situation, and certainly everybody's been affected by it. The the knowledge of this this paradigm shift that you can reach out and touch Whitley is aware. Everybody knows about it. Uh, Are we going to have amnesia when all of this is done after we've been shaken and scared to our core, or are we going to rise up and, and just be different? Well, both things are going to happen. You can look back on past pandemics to see, well, like the black death, which was, a really upsetting pandemic. It, it 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 probably killed more than half of the population of Europe, and of course, in those days, they had no idea what was going on. They didn't even know what the human body really was in 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 the medieval period. No idea at all, and so they were just dying like flies. Afterwards, the following things happened. First, the surf the population of serfs became a population of peasants. In other words, they began to demand more because there were fewer of them. And if somebody wanted their farmland worked, they were going to have to pay. And so the feudal system began to break down, which would lead inevitably to the Renaissance years, but a long time later. But that that was the first real crack in the feudal system. Now go But within 25 or 30 years, people weren't thinking about it anymore. And another example more recently is the Spanish flu epidemic. 1919 to 1922, unbelievable number of hundreds of millions of people died all all across the world. But by 1925, it was the roaring 20s. And we had put it behind us. We weren't thinking about it anymore. We didn't really know how to prevent it. I mean, their method of preventing it was cotton masks. Mm -hmm. And that was it. They had essentially no treatment for it whatsoever. If you got that flu, you either lived or you didn't. And and that was it. Uh, You know, there was just 
of the treatments consisted of things like steam, breathing steam and stuff. Uh, but they forgot about it because they couldn't think about it. We're not going to be that way this time. We back in um, back in the uh, uh, about a year ago, the administration made the decision to drop its pandemic task force on the theory that things like that are so unlikely that why should we spend the money on this task force? And any number of I'm not blaming one administration or another. Uh, anyone sailing a country through waters like this is going to make mistakes. And that just, you know, you can't, you can't be a, uh, uh, you can't try to quarterback a thing like this. You just have to hope that basically overall we do fine. But in any case, what we didn't understand was that this could, uh, uh, an epidemic could move so quickly and things happened in December and January and, you know, no matter – there's this big argument going on right now, is China responsible or not? Uh, the M- Mike Pompeo and President Trump are saying, yeah, it came from a lab in China. The intelligence community is saying it didn't. So right now we have basically no idea what the truth is, and we may never find out. However, one thing that we do know that was extensively reported, was reported in the New York Times, is that – 140,000 Chinese came as tourists to the United States and Canada in December after this virus was known to be a problem in China, and a lot of them came from Wuhan. Now, they weren't put on planes by a sinister Chinese government who said, hey, get it, get, take this over there. They were the wealthy, and they got out of there because they were afraid. Mm-hmm. And they landed here on tourist visas. I remember very well. I live in Santa Monica, and I, I walk every night. And I was walking down on on uh, on our bluff, and I was amazed at all of the Chinese tourists. And so I thought to myself, what is going on? Is, this isn't the time of year they usually show up here. And there's too many of them. Everybody, every other person, couple walking past was speaking Chinese. And so I looked into it, and I saw that there was this virus reported in Wuhan, and I immediately bought supplies. (laughs) Uh, Right. I bought gloves and masks and Lysol and all of it, because I figured, this is coming. And, you know, we were blindsided by it anyway. I mean, I wasn't blindsided by it, because, you know, (laughs) I'm I'm very doom conscious. Well, you yeah. spend your life with the visitors, and they're already they're always doing the doom and gloom thing. Well, you did um, write Superstorm, so let's not. <laughs> and I wrote Superstorm. I mean, I'm, I'm this is my mindset. Let right, me put it that right, way. It's right. not their fault. Right. Uh, it's my mindset. I'm not going to blame them for my mindset. Although I think they have the same mindset. <laughs> At least the ones I know do. Um, well, let me let me uh, kind of set up for when we come back after the break, uh, and it, and it, and it's this: we have heard many, many, many times uh, uh, from you and others uh, the very consistent message from uh, our ET brothers and sisters out there, which is, you guys ain't ready. You guys need to make some changes. You guys need to grow up. You guys need to, uh, uh, you know, go back to your room and and stay there for a while. You're grounded. Well, you, look, right? I'm right? sick and tired of that carping, but I'm very well aware of it. That's it's, right. That's right. And I happen to have a better opinion of us than that. <laughs> and that's we'll talk why. about that when we come back. <laughs> exactly. And is this something that um, is, you know, our reaction? to how we treat each other through this crisis. Is this something that is being observed? Oh, well, yeah. I mean, I've, I've been heavily involved in that. And I, I know I've learned a lot of things. I am not going to say that they told me because that is not how it works. But I have this implant in my ear. I know how to use it. And I have used it to gain insight into this, and I think I've gained some strong, useful, valuable insight. It's nowhere near, it's not off the wall at all. It's very solid. 
and we can get into that because I've, I've researched it very deeply. And th- there are ways of fixing this. Are and you, in fact, oh, yeah, go ahead. No, well, that was my question is, have you been sharing uh, what you've learned? Well, uh, yeah, on my website and with some medical people I know who are, who are uh, doing research in this area, yes. And they know perfectly well that the information's coming, the source of the information, and they're fine with that. They'll use it or not use it as they see fit. But, uh, but the last two blog entries are basically a reflection of what I learned. Now, somebody on, just... On, the, on, on Unknown Country in Whitley's Journal. Somebody just tweeted, and I wanted to share this with you. Hey, Jimmy, please thank Whitley for his Dreamland Meditations. So, oh, yeah. yeah. I do that every Thursday night live free on YouTube and it's a meditation designed to calm you and strengthen you from within and it's good it works well a lot of people are benefiting from it do you uh i'm i'm, I'm not making light because i do it do you burn sage candles do that sort of thing uh no i'm much too dangerous with fire i any <laughs> Annie liked to burn sage, but she wouldn't let me near it because she said, Whitley, everything you touch turns, the sage falls apart, the rug catches on fire. It's too dangerous. And she's right. So, no, I don't, it's not, I don't feel a need to. I feel, I feel very, I don't feel necessarily protected, but I feel very much uh, at peace with my, my life. In other words, if I get this, I get it. I'm not going to go out and look for it. Right. But if I get it, then I'm going to live with that or not, depending on what happens. But I'm not going to, I'm not, and, and in terms of protecting myself against this, the, the, the other level of reality, I live with it all the time in my life. It's in my life every day, every night. So, no, I don't feel in the least a need to protect myself. You know, it's, it's part weird. Of me, part of my life. And for me, I don't know the ceremony behind sage. I, there are plenty out there that do, but I don't. I just like the smell of it. And I feel that I am doing something right in doing it. And I know that's, well, that's you weird. Well, do it. I yeah. mean, it's nothing wrong with it, clearly. No, it smells good. I mean, it's, not gonna, it's, not, it's, it's not like vaping or something. It's nice. Yeah, yeah, so, exactly. Well, you know, it's just like weed. You know, I'll burn weed. I don't smoke it, but I'll just stink up the house with it. I'm just kidding, Whitley. Just kidding. That's where you're supposed to insert the uh, courtesy laugh. <laughs> <laughs> Whitley Streber is our guest. Whitley, let's take our break right here. When we come back, we're going to go straight to it. We're going to start discussing the visitors. And I got a couple of questions in here uh, that popped up in Twitter for Whitley. I'll get to those two as well. This is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, Whitley Streber on the Game Changer Network and KGRA, The Planet. You can follow me on Twitter at JChurchRadio. You can also follow Whitley at Whitley Streber, and those links are up in our Twitter feed. Stay right there. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Our guest tonight, Whitley Streber. And right before the break, I want to pick up where we left off. And Whitley, you mentioned the implant. And and so I want to get to the foundation of the visitors for those out there that uh, don't, may not know what uh, we're about to, to discuss. Uh, but getting to the implant really quick, uh, Sarah just tweeted out. She said, can you remind us again which ear uh, the implant is uh, behind? It's in my in the outer part of my left ear, in the toward just uh, just above the top of the pina, which is the outer part of the ear. Um, and it's been in uh, 1994. It, night, it was put in in 1989. I was awake when it happened. I saw the people. They were not aliens. They were people who came in and did it, two of them, a man and a woman. I could not stop them. 
and they did it. And in 1994, there was an attempt made to take it out. When the doctor t- opened up the little the little incision, he saw a white disc. And when he touched it to try to pull it out, it moved on its own down into my earlobe through under the skin and got away from him. It scared him because he was not expecting that. He, mm-hmm. he had, he, as far as he was concerned, he was removing a cyst. He had not been fully informed. I should have perhaps been a little bit more open with him. Anyway, he pulled out, of course, because there's nothing you could do. He said, Mr. Strieber, I'm going to have to take your ear off. I said, well, I, we can't do that. And he sewed it up, and two days later, it went back up into the place where it is now. A little nick of it was taken off as it moved away from his scalpel and sent to a research laboratory, and or, or rather, a, a, um, a, first to a, to a, a lab, a regular medical lab, and they observed that it had it was a metallic base with what they described as proteinaceous cilia coming out of it. And then it was taken to Southwest Research and allegedly lost. And I never heard from about it again. But the rest of it came back. And in the, in the old days, every once in a while, my ear would turn red and get very hot. And it would be apparently transmitting something. And I had no idea how to use it what it was there for. I used to, Annie used to say it's not a, probably not a tracking device because nobody from Arcturus is going to take care of whether or not you're heading down to the 7-Eleven. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's, I couldn't agree with more, her more. Anyway, in 2015, Annie passed away and in, in, in August and in October, I began to notice there was a sort of neatly neat slit in my right eye in the in my field of vision and words were passing through it very quickly quicker than i could read them and over the years i have learned how this works it is a mnemonic device that means it assists memory it is not a mind control device what it does is it pulls things up from inside my memory banks in my mind that I would not have access to. It's like something that is a, it it enhances the brain's filing system. And the result has been, I, I, I began to figure it out in September, October of 2015. And I started writing a historical model, which is called in Hitler's house. And I used the implant, I practiced, and I used the implant to find out all kinds of unbelievably obscure details about Hitler and his his life. And the novel was written by a person who was close to him and becomes realizes he's evil and becomes a spy for the Allies. And uh but but lives actually lives with Hitler and is a close friend of Hitler's. That's the idea of the novel. But you, in order to do that, he, he's got to be able to be writing a memoir, which is the book he's writing a memoir set in the 1970s. But he has to write it. It has to sound like someone who actually lived in that period. Not just a lot of historical research, but the, the texture of life has to be immediate. And it is in the book. It is. A lot of the reviewers will say it's like reading something from somebody who was really there. And that's how the implant works. Now, more recently, I began to do more serious research with it. And I used it in the research for A New World, my new book. And I used it with the way you, you ask yourself questions. And the answers kind of fall together. It's really interesting the way it works. It doesn't tell you things. It's not giving you instructions. In other words, it's not interrupting your independence or your freedom of thought or your freedom of will. But it is helping you make those things work better. That's how it works. And the the visitors, which we've discussed many times on this program, but 
uh, as we move forward tonight. Uh, who are they? <laughs> oh, that's an easy question to answer. I have no idea. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I mean, people want to say they want to like something to wrap their imaginations around. And I, under, I understand that they want to wrap their imaginations around this mystery and think to themselves, well, it's, these are beings from some planet somewhere that someone said they've channeled them and they, they're from this planet or that planet and they named this and named that. But that's not how it works. Something is going on here that's extraordinary. It has as much to do with us as it does with them. But I'll tell you something about it that's fascinating. If you look back over the lore of the fairy folk and the gods and the djinn and all that stuff from going back into the mists of the past, you will find an awful lot of that lore is very much like the UFO close encounter and abduction lore. Very much. And if you look at the way this worked, it was kind of kind of uh, knocking along in the in the it, it was it reached a sort of peak in the nineteenth century, but then people became more educated and they began to think that, well, this stuff about these little beings can't be true. And you know, there were some hoaxes, some famous hoaxes that that sort of put the kibosh on the whole thing, and it was kind of forgotten. Then we began to have these wars. And during World War II, these strange lights that were called Foo Fighters began showing up in, in over Germany and being observed by the Allies. And after the war, it became clear that they were not a German secret weapon, that they were something unknown. Then we dropped the atomic bomb. And in 1947, all of a sudden, this same presence that had actually probably been with us from the beginning of time ramped up and became a huge, what it is now, a huge worldwide phenomenon and an incredible mystery. And that we know there is someone there. And that's where we are. And I think they ramped this up because they began to think we were in some kind of trouble. I mean, we're do dropping A-bombs on each other. We're killing millions and millions of our young people in these wars. Of course, there's something wrong. Right. And I think they're concerned. Now, and, I, I and to be very concerned, and and to be clear, the other interesting part about this, maybe even the most most interesting part, is that the Germans were observing the Foo Fighters too, and they thought it was us, right? <laughs> it, well, right. Yeah. No, there, there's there, there's been there's been it's been proved that the amount of energy that was being put out by that light could not have been been anything that could be built at that time by either side. And this business about German flying saucers and so forth is interesting entertainment, but that's all. The uh, There's another uh, point to this that uh, I, I need to touch upon, uh, not only for myself, but for the audience, because I've heard you uh, reference and, and speak about this uh, for so long now that I've gone through a few different visions of my own about who the visitors are. And going back to uh, the the little blue beings, right, and the possibility yeah. of, of who they were and, and maybe they were us, maybe another dimension, maybe it's after death, th there was that element of it. And then I often thought about, a situation like maybe the movie Phantasm, right? Which is a horror flick, sure, but the uh, but the little beings in that movie were from the other side, from another dimension, and and I always equated, you know, that in my I resolved it in my own mind's eye that maybe Whitley's right here, and then going to the visitors, are we talking about? Is this the same? The, the blue beings, the visitors, is it something physical from another dimension and that is uh, purely earthbound? Uh, I don't think it's, you know, I think it's 
I think it's the most complicated thing that's ever happened is what I think. Sure. I think that there are a number of elements involved in it, and we make a big mistake by assuming that all of this strange stuff is, has the same origin somehow or is the same thing. Exactly. It isn't. Right. I think that our own dead play a huge role in this. I know Annie does in my life and in the lives of many other people, and she is a she is of real presence and force in my life to this day. Uh, and not only her, but many people from the other side. She's she has her ability to communicate with me and to convince me very skillfully that it really was her, and that's all in the book Afterlife Revolution. Uh, opened a door because now I know that's possible. I, I, and, and therefore there's others as well. And the, oh, by the way, I'm going to say something here. People are thinking, well, why don't they tell you what's going to happen to us? And Annie said a very interesting thing to me right after she died, when I was, uh, really communicating her with her very fully that two things. One is that she said, it looks like you're all intentionally ignoring us. And she also said, we do tell you what we know of the future, but you can't hear us. Hmm. And I think those are true statements, both of them. Because we're here living in the time stream. We are living in time, and we're not meant to live outside of time. And when we try to do that and to peek at the future... You don't know what you may see. You may see your own imagination. You may see something real. You can't tell because that's not how we're made. So they may be telling us everything that we want to know, but we can't hear them because of what we are. Okay, so... so, Exactly. So back to the process here. Yeah, okay. There's So our dead are involved in this, and they have been forever, but we're just now beginning to realize that it's real and it's quantifiable and it's it's something that's part of the universe. They are there is an afterlife and there are people living in it and they are very very different from what they were when they were alive. Make no mistake about that. Two, there are apparently aliens here too. I think that they don't have the same veil between the worlds that we do. I do not think that they are as attached to time as we are. I think they are living, looking into time from the outside, much like our dead do, but they have bodies that, and, or can have if they wish, physical bodies that will flow in time like we do. And then there are other entities. I think there are entities that are spiritual entities that are not human. Uh, that are ab- above that and below that level, too. I think that also that, and this is one of the most extraordinary things that's happened. I Last summer, I was at the Dakota Sioux Reservation in Pine Ridge, and I found myself over the three days I was there, when I closed my eyes, I was seeing into another version of the same place. It was totally clear. I mean, I could I could lean down at the at, at, on a sidewalk or on uh, in the grass and close my eyes and see another detailed version of what I was looking at with slightly different stones and flowers and things, and then open my eyes and I would see this world again. It was. And when I was driving, riding, I didn't drive, I, I was driven around, the the roads were nicely graded. They were modern highways. There was one one road, and it was very nicely done. And, you know, we were driving along it, but when I closed my eyes, that road disappeared, and I saw instead an older road that went that went along a track. And, it, it, and when it, when we got to a hillside, the new road was graded right across it. You just went over it in a straight line, but the old road followed the contours of the land. So it felt like the car was flying and it would take in flight because it felt like it had left the road. Right. And, and it went on for three days and three nights. 
And I was left thinking, I was seeing a parallel universe. Right, right. Now, what do I see on the cover of the April 11th to 17th New Scientist? Our cosmic lost twin, the Big Bang, didn't make one universe. It made two. It has been pretty well proved that this other universe exists right here, right now. Isn't that amazing? I think that's extraordinary. Yeah, and... and so there are going to be people who know how to cross back and forth. Right. Or, or by accident. Or by accident, too, as well. Or by accident. <laughs> well, like in the book, I mentioned these two children who showed up in medieval England... And, and they were clearly, I mean, the, the descriptions that, that they left behind of the world they had come from was the world I saw. Every detail is there. It, and, and, and even it was, for example, the light wasn't as strong in that world. That is explainable scientifically. Physicists would expect that from we, what we understand about what this world must be. Now, we know it's there. They probably know that we're here. So will the twain ever meet? Is there going to be a door opening between the worlds? Or is that already true? Do you think that that is possibly what the implant is for? No, I don't. I think the implant was put in by a man named Constantine Rodave. And I will tell you a little bit about that. Constant, first of all, why do I think that? Okay. A doctor who works very seriously on this business he's, was wanting me to get a CT scan of the implant. And over the years, various doctors in, in organizations that take this stuff seriously and have reason to do so have wanted to get their hands on that implant, obviously. I've been a little hesitant about getting rid of it, getting it out, because Annie, who who's, I trust with my soul, she's the wisest person I ever knew, always said, Whitley, don't take it out. Learn it. The one time I tried to take it out, we had agreed, you will never try this again. I think she knew more about this stuff than she was saying. And she knew darn well it, it wasn't going to come out. <laughs> she was not worried about that. Anyway, be that as it may. Uh, I, I took the CAT scan, but two days before I took the CAT scan of my ear, the, um, these, it came a knock at the door at four o'clock in the morning. Now, do you no normally answer a knock on the door at four o'clock in the morning? Of course not. And neither do I, but I did answer this because I was already in an altered state. I opened the door and there were two men there. One of them I have known a long time. I've seen him many times. The other one I did not know, or I, at least I don't remember. And I knew immediately this was an unusual experience. Let me put it that way. And I let them in, of course, because I wanted the experience, whatever it was going to be, uh, especially if they took me to some cool place like in a UFO, but that did not happen, sadly. In any case, mm -hmm. I let them in. And they proceeded to explain the implant to me and how it had been made and what it did. When I was talking a little bit earlier about it, drawing information from the sort of file system in my brain, that's who I learned it from that night, how it works. And the young man who was doing the talking said, the other one was probably there to beat me up if I tried to do any, any, anything, anything, any funny business. They don't trust me. They know I'd steal a UFO in a heartbeat if I got the chance. And in case, uh, he was explaining that this man called Constantine Rawdive, he pronounced it Rawdive, had uh, devised this thing, and it was a communicator between the living and the dead, which would explain why it started to work so well after Annie died, because she was using it on the other side. It probably still is. So... Um, Okay, that happened, and it ended, and I did not try anything. I, I was not able to really move, and we were sitting together, but I could not, like, get up and walk across the room or anything like that. It was like a, 
it was like I had sort of local anesthesia, you know, when you when 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 you've had a spinal or something and you can't move but you're fine, you're you're you know, you're completely alert and so forth. And the you know, the doctor's down there doing whatever he's doing to your knee or whatever. Um that was how I was the state I was in. But they left and the state immediately wore off. It wasn't anesthesia, it was something else they were doing. Because the second they were out of the house, it was over. I rushed to the door, they were still gone. So I immediately went into my office and tried various spellings of this name. And I soon came up, I soon realized this name looks so familiar. And I thought, wait a minute, he was mispronouncing it. That's Constantine Rodave, the famous EVP, electronic voice uh, communications uh, scientist who worked on communicating electronically with the dead during his lifetime and made some extraordinary progress. And I thought, my God, the guy is still doing it. He's working from the other side, and that's what this thing is. Wonderful, extraordinary. So I was talking a few days, and this is the way this whole experience works, and it's so fundamentally cool. I was talking to a friend, who, and I was telling him about the slit in the eye and stuff, and he said, well, you know, and this is the only other person I know of who's ever said this. I have the same thing. I said, really? He said, yeah, it's been there for years. And it's words racing past. I can't really read them, and I don't know quite what it's about. I might have, he says, he thinks he might have an implant, but there's no overt evidence of it. But here's the thing about this man that's so extraordinary. He is an expert on Constantine Rodave and has made a big documentary about him. So, you see what you're looking at? You're looking at technology that's coming into our world from our own dead. You're looking at aliens, almost certainly uh, uh, the the Tic Tac video is probably, a, those are aliens, and there's some, some other video. Uh, the uh, I've got a lot of video anyway here that's probably authentic UFO videos. There's plenty of authentic UFO video around. They are real. And my guess is at least some of that is aliens. Uh, you have these beings like the dark blue figures who I think are earthly creatures, but just radically different from us. And you have, you have all kinds of stuff going on. I mean, I think it's wonderful. I think it's absolutely fascinating. Not all of it's pretty. That's for sure. I mean, I got beat up plenty in this thing. You know, I got the, what I politely described to my great misfortune as a rectal probe uh, in 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 December 26, 1985, and became a laughing stock for having been raped. And I, you know, I would go on TV and be laughed at about that. And then the next day, go to the doctor for treatment for the scar tissue of the rape. So no, it's not all pretty. But let's, let's it's fascinating. That's it's sure. it's definitely fascinating. And we're going to take a a quick uh, break right here, Whitley. And when we come back, we'll talk about how the communication and translation uh, has been happening with you and and what you have found out. This is Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Our guest tonight, Whitley Streber. We're talking about the visitors. What is going on with us, our planet, and what are we going through in the future? This is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Network and KGRA, The Planet. Stay with us. We'll be right back after this quick break.
Welcome back. Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Our guest tonight, Whitley Strieber. And I invite all of you to go and visit unknowncountry.com and subscribe. And Whitley's Dreamland and Unknown Country, not only has it been an Internet staple since just about the beginning of the net, but it's the reason that uh, you should have the Internet today. And I've been a part of it for so many years now. I want to thank you, Whitley, for keeping your foot on the gas. And for everybody out there, uh, go and subscribe uh, to Unknown Country uh, and and do it today. And, and go in and click on the banners over at uh, JimmyChurchRadio.com. Whitley, this, um, uh, this communication, as you uh, now uh, have become to understand how to use this, how how do you initiate? I'm very curious about that. I mean, is it like a, a remote control on a TV set? Is it that easy for you? No. Um, there, in as in as of September of 2015, a few weeks after Annie passed away, um, someone began waking me up at three o'clock in the morning. I've been doing something called the sensing exercise. Since 1970, I learned it in a, in a group called the Gurji Foundation. Uh, based on, it's a group that works does inner, interior work based on the ideas of an Armenian mystic called G. R. Gurdjieff, who was an extraordinary man and um, difficult man to understand, but he had a lot of wisdom. And one of the things he believed was that consciousness is not only in the brain, in the mind. That we, it's not that consciousness is in us, that we are in consciousness and that the, the body itself is part of consciousness. And this exercise called the sensing exercise is very ancient. It, he brought it to the West and is a sort of yoga where you place your attention on your physical sensation of your body and you hold it there and you let your mind flow on its own. And after I, after Annie passed away, the first thing that happened was I was at a William Henry conference in uh, Nashville at the Scarrett Bennett Center, and a lady walked up to me and said, Mr. Streber, the strangest thing just happened. Annie had been talking, communicating to me by talking to other people. So they would talk to me because she knew I'm much too thick-headed to, to believe that that uh, it was her if she talked directly to me. I would think it was my imagination. In fact, when she told me to take out the garbage and do the dishes and stuff, I usually thought that was my imagination when she was alive. So she was not wrong to do it this way. Anyway, the lady comes up and she says, Mr. Streber, I just had the strangest thing happen to me. I heard your wife's voice, and she'd been to some of our conferences, so she knew exactly, and listened to us on the radio, exactly what Annie sounded like. Say in my ear, tell Whitley that I can see him when he's sitting in the chair. And I thought, my word, the sensing exercise. I do it every night when I'm sitting in that chair, sitting, it's a little couch, actually. And... I thought, well, I'm going to do it more. And so as soon as I got home, I started really doing it because I'd, I'd known for years that the visitors responded to it. They, they had, I think that's how they originally became interested in me because I did this and they realized that they could com- use, use this methodology to communicate with me. So then I get home and a week or so later, somebody starts to wake me up. First, they electrify one of my toes, and that leaps, caused me to leap out of bed at 3 o'clock in the morning. I figure, you know, I can't explain it, so I figured it wasn't gout or anything like that, and I figured it was just some, some weird thing that happened to me. Then the next night, having failed to wake up this old lump, successfully get him to make the right connections, the night before, it's more blunt. Someone that I cannot see grabs my right nipple and shakes a dickens out of it. I would have not been surprised if there was a Whitley body 
form in the ceiling at that point. I mean, I got up, I woke up right away. Sure. Once, once again, it's three o'clock in the morning. And I think you moron. They're after you to do, they want you, oh, this is the sensing issue. They used to try to get me to do it back in the 90s in the, in the cabin in uh, upstate New York. And I did it for a few weeks with them then at three. They really like that. And it turns out, uh, someone, my website's a very social website. It's got a lot of, uh, there's a, there's a free message board and there's places where the subscribers can comment and there's a weekly chat on seven o'clock every Wednesday night. So it's a very social, very oriented website. It's a place where people can go to be together. And so one of the people on the website said to me, you know, Whitley, that this is something, this is a very ancient practice. It's a yoga practice. And I'm going to try hard to remember the name of it because it's, I had it up here and now it's not coming up. But uh, I'll get to it at, at some point in the show. But right now I'm just going to have to say that. And I looked it up and it's something that doing this at that hour has been part of a certain type of yoga because it enables you to contact the spirit world more fully at a time when everyone's mind is quiet around you. They're all sleeping. Amazing. And she, they wanted me, she, I guess, wanted me to do it then. And I've been doing it then ever since. Every night. I never fail to get up at 3 o'clock in the morning and do it. I do not set an alarm because I want it to be organic. And the interesting thing is, if I don't wake up, they will wake me up. At first it was very harsh, but now it's much more gentle. There will be a, a weight that comes down on my legs from above, and it feels very loving and, and sweet and heavy enough to wake me up, and there's a slight electricity to it. Or there might someone might uh, blow like night before last. Uh, yeah, night before last, someone blew in my face. They used to blow in my face a lot uh, to, to get me. And it, but it wasn't like someone going, <sighs> blowing with their lungs. It was more like they were like kind of pushing the air out. Of something, it didn't feel normal. It didn't feel like a normal gust of of breath. So that's what that's where I am with that, and I do it. I'm they're with me all the time. I'm just heavily, heavily involved with them. Somebody just said Quajigan yoga. No, I, I'll find it in a minute. Okay, um, okay. It, it starts with an H, folks. <laughs> that helps. <laughs> Now, uh, is it like, uh, and we'll get to the, the substance of everything here uh, uh, right now shortly, but is it, is, it, um, is it audible? Is it like Morse code? Is it more of a feeling? Is it, a, is it a, just one load of, of download that you have to unpack later? Uh, no, they're, it's, it's, they're silent. They don't make any noise at all. I mean, the only, I guess you well, you know, there's been some very strange stuff in this in this place. I have to be honest with you. Um, like I had, I got a sleep app. I've, I've tried videotaping this for so many years, but I, in fact, I tried recently. And what happened was this: the one night when I thought there might have been someone physical in here, I have a Nest camera. And I thought, well, finally, and I had it on for about a week. And I thought to myself, well, finally, maybe I've got something at last. And so I turned on, I looked on the, the app and, you know, it has all these moments where you, something it's recorded, et cetera. And it, I think it was at 12, 10 PM for AM for about an hour, the camera turned itself off. It used to do that a lot, and I would always think that there was someone here when that happened. And so I've the hell with the camera; it's pointless because they turn. It, there was someone here, I'm sure, and they turn it off. They make it turn off so that they, they're not seen. Okay, so that makes my life easier. I'm so happy. Um, I tried a sleep app, which what it does is it picks up any vocalizations and stuff during the night when you're sleeping. And 
amazingly enough, for a few nights, it worked and worked well. And one of the things that was amazing was I heard myself talking to people I had no idea I was talking to, but who I knew well, but I did not, I do not in this consciousness know that I know them. For example, one night you hear me go, oh, and I'm waked up suddenly and you can hear it in my voice. It's just, oh, and then I realized there's someone there. And I said, I, you hear me say, oh, mature. And then a second, few seconds later, I have a vague memory of just, it's so vague, I can't even say what it is. But I hear my voice say very pleasantly and, and obviously I'm looking forward to whatever's about to happen. I say, teach me, mature. Hmm. I knew who this was. Hmm. This was someone who comes to me a lot and who I welcome in my life. But in this consciousness, talking to you right now, Jimmy, I have no idea wow. who it was. Isn't that incredible? Yeah, it is. I it think is. it's quite incredible. It is. It is. And when did did the uh, did the communication, uh, for the lack of a better word, Whitley, I apologize, but uh, did the communication with the visitors uh, uh, get amplified and become more frequent after uh, the first of the year when certainly this planet started to go through some pretty rough changes? Well, it, it, actually, it started like that in the fall. And, you know, I was, I think one of the reasons I was so attuned to this situation was and started buying supplies in December the way I did was because I was aware without being able to put my finger on it, that there was something up. And uh, I wish I could say that they had warned me and that I had warned everybody, but it just didn't work like that, and it apparently does not work like that. And I'm not so sure that that I'm... I think I'm right about the fact that we can't see the future. It's not that they can't, but that we can't, even if we're told, because we're not meant to. It's not the way we're built. Anyway, Did, yeah, that, I, I felt I, uneasy enough to buy uh, surgical gloves, for God's sakes, and N95 masks, which I had no, I mean, no reason in the world to buy. And, but I bought a box, a couple of boxes of the masks and a couple of boxes of the of the gloves, and I was able to give some to my family. And I wish I had made more noise about it, but I didn't really make a connection. In other words, what I'm telling you is I probably was told, but I could not bring that into my conscious mind any more than I can tell you who that person I just talked about, whom I'm so familiar with and obviously enjoy the company of enormously. I cannot tell you a single thing about that person, who they are, where they're from, what they look like, anything. But believe me, I know. Somewhere, and I know I know. I just can't reach it. So that's kind of where that is. I mean, I would guess I was told and couldn't can't, couldn't reach it. You know what's interesting about the mask and the gloves, uh, which we have, uh, we've got a stock of them, but I, I don't wear them uh, so much for uh, preventing or spreading coronavirus. I wear them so I can go shopping. <laughs> yeah, well, same it's here. I, you know, I'm 74, and so I'm pretty careful because I figure, you know, if I'm going to croak uh, from coronavirus, I'm going to feel like a fool because, you know, I, I, I'm i not an anti-vaxxer and I'm not a person who doesn't believe in it and or anything like that. I take it very seriously, and I am trying to, to, to protect myself. Sure. So, yeah, I do I do definitely. And I don't go out any more than I absolutely have to, for, especially not at the grocery store and stuff. Now, what uh, I'm going to ask you some specific questions. Uh, the in this in this communication, this uh, uh, however we want to turn that, that you brought up something earlier in the show, and that is borders. And you know that borders, uh, uh, you know that's a that's a fictitious statement. There are no yeah, walls. They, they look like borders, but they're not borders. Right, and it, it's really strange on this planet. 
where there are certain parts of this planet that are really affected and there are others that are not. Is that down to, and is it the individual? Is it like DNA? You know, what, why, why are we having certain parts of, of the world, you know, really affected and others, which are populated just like any place else and in some cases heavily, but it isn't as, uh, it's not in areas as affected. Why is that? Well, first of all, it's still too early in the progress of this disease to know how the world, how it's going to play out around the world, number one. Number two, the reason it is hitting the developed countries faster and harder is that they are much, people in these countries are much more mobile. Uh, uh, they come in into these, you know, there's much more movement or there was, I mean, there isn't at the moment, but there was in air travel, much more air travel, like between Hong Kong and London or New York or L.A. or Milan than, say, travel between uh, uh, Hong Kong and, and Lagos or Kinshasa or somewhere like that, simply because of the the fact that there's not as much reason to go to the, thir- the these countries. And so the virus, fortunately, has spread more slowly there. Also, it could be there's some evidence that it is like the uh, some other coronaviruses that is heat sensitive. That's not entirely clear yet, but it might turn out that that is the case. In which case, that these countries that are in tropical areas are, thank God, not going to be so badly hit because these this is where their populations are just so vulnerable. You know, they have. One ventilator per 100,000 people in Nigeria. So one thing is very clear in Nigeria. If you get COVID and you start to become unable to breathe, you're going to die, period. Mm -hmm. Um, So let's hope they don't get it, I mean, frankly. Uh, But you don't know what will happen. And also another thing. Reporting is from many parts of the world is just very minimal. I mean, you're talking about a planet which has a fantastic gap between the richest and the poorest. I mean, I'm not talking about the billionaires. I'm talking about us. We're the richest countries, us in Europe and parts of Asia. But when, you know, you, there are plenty of people in this world who live in under $200 a year. And yet prices are the same in their countries as they are here. So, you know, those people are living extremely minimal lives, and they have nothing, nothing to fall back on at all, whatsoever. Now, you mentioned... And uh, no, well, let me, let oh, me yeah, go ahead. The last sure. And there's not going to be any reporting about what's going to happen, what's happening to them. We won't even know it. Yeah, that's uh, that's another part for me that... Uh, I'm still trying to uh, come to grips with, which is, I mean, testing is needed. You need to test everybody because you need data and and things. Without testing, what are you reporting on, right? If you don't have the data to come in, then what is it that you are establishing everything on? Rumor? You can't do that. You know, it it just seems like everybody on this planet has got to get tested. Everybody. I don't think anybody should be left out. I don't think that's true, actually. I disagree there. I I think that there's something else that we need to do. What's that? We need to understand this better. And here's exactly what we need to understand precisely. And that is there are a large number of people who get this disease and either don't know it or have extremely mild symptoms and it goes away without any suggestion of a hospital, maybe a slight fever, nothing. It's nothing for them. You can have two people, 35, each of them 35 years old, both of them perfectly healthy with no known underlying conditions. One of them is devastated and the other gets it too and doesn't even know it. Now, What is the difference between those two people? This is what we need to understand. Because once we can identify the people who are really genuinely at risk, 
And that's going to be a small number after all. Because, you know, you're talking about a, the United States, a country of 300 plus million people. And it, it, we just recently reached a million people having this illness that we know of. And the reason is there's probably millions more who had it and didn't even know it. Who are the people who get the symptoms, severe symptoms, and, and, and are laid up by this and even hospitalized or even die? Why are they, what is different about them? This is what we need to know. It's something to do with their genes, almost certainly. There's something in their genetic makeup or the structure of their cells. Like there is a, um, there's a receptor on uh, cells in the lungs called an ACE2 receptor. It's on a lot of cells, actually, in different parts of the body. And this receptor is what the COVID virus attaches to. Now, does this receptor, is it different in certain people? Or are, they, do they, are they born with more of them? What is it that causes certain people to have this? Once we can, once we can take a DNA test on someone and say, yep, you are at risk, and to someone else, no, you're not at serious risk, we're, we're golden. We can open up safely. Right. And what's happening in this country now is very understandable. People are, I mean, how, how does it feel? I'm, I don't have an immediate problem with, like, uh, my rent or anything, but I have friends who can't pay. Right. Who can't pay their credit cards, who can't pay their rent, who can't buy food. Lots of friends. And, hey, those people are not going to sit there and die. They're going to take the risk, and we have to find out, we have to concentrate on minimizing that risk, and we can do it. And there are scientific groups working on that right now, and th but they have to be, we have to understand very clearly, this is the correct focus. This is how we should go about it, because once we have those people that cohort of people identified, then we can move ahead safely. And the, the danger of doing it is it's happening naturally now, and I, can't, I would never blame anyone who goes out there and demonstrates or goes back to work because I understand perfectly where they're coming from. I surely perfectly. do. I do. We, we all do. Absolutely. But, but we have to be able to identify these people. And the reason it's dangerous now is because it's probably going to cause a, a huge increase in the number of cases. And the danger is that the combination of the hospitals being overwhelmed by not only huge num a, a huge increase in patients, but also economic issues that are causing them to close down and, and lay off doctors and nurses at a time like this. Uh, the, the 21 critical care hospitals in Texas have closed down in the past six months. And they, they, I mean, the past three months, and I think it's 21. And it's mostly in rural areas because they don't have the money. And some st states are at the edge of bankruptcy. And when the states go bankrupt and the policemen and the firemen can't be paid, you're dropping back down into the dark ages very quickly. This is a serious, immediate, extraordinary problem we have not fully yet wrapped our minds around, and we have to. We have to, because this is beautiful, what we've made in this world. And I don't mean just America. I mean all of these wonderful countries full of brilliant, beautiful, educated people, full of adventure and excitement and zest for life. We can't let that go. No, and you know, Rita said to me uh, yesterday, stop me in my tracks, Whitley. Rita goes, we spent a couple of hundred years making uh, the United States this wonderful country, and we took it down in two months, right? And she, it was just like one of yeah. the most profound statements that how quickly things can be uh, undone. Well, we, we're in the, we're in, we're literally, I mean, the cliche, we're between a rock and a hard place. And we are, uh, because, you know, we have to open the economy or we 
you're going to have a catastrophe, and a lot more people are going to die of that than of COVID, on the one hand. On the other hand, if we don't do this very carefully and very correctly, then the economy is going to be cratered by the breakdown that is going to be caused by being overwhelmed by too much COVID. So, you know, we, we got we to gotta find a happy medium. And the, the key to me is finding out so that we know in advance who is vulnerable and who isn't. Once we know that and we can find that out, it's not impossible, as I say, that there are uh, – this is definitely being worked on right now, and I, let me just grab my paperwork here. Um, all right. Certain genetic variants, especially in genes that influence the immune system, seem to predispose people to a host of infectious diseases. And this is a, there is a group that's, what is it? This Dr. Kerry Stephenson asks. He's head of Decode Genetics, an Icelandic subsidiary of Amgen. Of Amgen. So he's a, heavy, he's a heavy hitter in this field. What is it that makes some people very sick and other people hardly sick at all? He says there are two major possibilities. Some people's genes may simply make them more vulnerable to serious illness, while others' genes may confer resistance. And we have to find out who is who. And once we do that, we are on our way to defeating this, even without a vaccine, which we may not have in time. Is Amgen, Amgen is right at the street from us, as you know, uh, here in the Valley. Um, and we need to take a break right here, but is Amgen actively uh, working on this? Every drug company in the world. Is. Yeah, I'm sure they are. Yeah, that was, uh, I realized the dumbness of my question yeah. as I came no, out of my but, but, we, but Amgen apparently is working on the genetic issue, which I consider the critical issue. No one talks about it, and it's not in the media much. Well, but let's, I can uh, assure you, I'm gonna it take will a, turn out to be critical. We're taking a break right here. Our guest tonight, Whitley Strieber. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. I guess tonight, Whitley Strieber. Whitley's links are over at jimmychurchradio.com. You can click Unknown Country. Strieber.com. All of his books are there, too, as well. And now, Whitley, uh, picking up where we just left off, it sounds like, I mean, this is a bright future, right? This isn't this isn't doom and gloom. If we, if you know what I'm saying, right? The fear porn that is we're out gonna, there right now. We will fix this, right? And, it, and you know, uh, all it takes is is intelligent leadership, and we've got that in this world. I mean, of course, countries are fumbling around. Our country is fumbling around. The Chinese fumbled around. Uh, other countries fumbled around. Some of them did better than others. The Germans did real well, and uh, 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 the Swedes are doing it completely differently, but their, their system seems to be working. I'm not so sure it would work here because this is a much bigger, more, much bigger, more diverse country. Uh, some of them didn't do it so well. The Brazil is not doing it well, and they're going to suffer. So, it, you know, it's a mixed bag. But the point is, we will get past this. Once and we, we will do it as mankind, as a species. Yeah, right. And so once we understand the genetics side of it, is this something that a technology like, say, CRISPR or some direct DNA modification instead of pursuing a vaccine, right, and, and trying to go that route uh, or developing some type of immunity and antibodies that uh, others are talking about right now and do it naturally. But is this something that we could use hard science on and oh, yeah. and just eliminate for, for the future of mankind? Oh, absolutely. Uh, we could, we could, we, it'll take longer to get, get it to that point. In other words, we, we eliminated smallpox. It's no longer with us. And I don't think we're ever going to eliminate the coronaviruses. They are, they are real clever suckers, and we've been with, they've been with us for a long time. You know, that vaccine research that's going on in England at, at Oxford 
had a head start because they were actually working on a vaccine for the common cold, which is the holy grail of all pharmaceutical vaccines, as you may imagine, mm-hmm. that, because everyone would love a vaccine for the, whole, for the common cold, and they were able to fold that research into coronavirus because it's also a corona, coronavirus. That, you know, the cold is also a coronavirus. But, so that that is one direction we, we will go in. I mean, there's a lot of anti-vaxxers out there who will not take a vaccine, though, and they will remain vulnerable uh, for that reason. But, you know, there's nothing you can do about that. There's also uh, other things that are being done. Uh, the, uh, the Gilead Pharmaceuticals uh, uh, product that they're rolling out right now works the same way that Tamiflu does. And what it does is it inhibits the virus's ability to reproduce and, and, and to, to reproduce itself. And therefore, the body gets a better chance to bring its own immune system, its immune response to, to, uh, into the picture. And it means that the, that the infection will last, won't last as long and the result of that is that people won't get overwhelmed by less likely to get overwhelmed by this thing because it's it's in the latter stages of it that they get over their the body gets overwhelmed and the immune system the virus begins to exponentially increase in numbers and the immune system kind of goes crazy and the immune system starts starts overwhelming the body's own the, the body itself, the fever goes crazy. Uh, apparently, this blood clotting thing that happens in some cases is related to the immune system going off track, and so it's a you know it, 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 the anti the anti the drug that uh, the antiviral that Gilead's working on might prevent that, and that would be a big plus if we could know that people yes. Some people might get very sick, but they won't get terminally sick. They're unlikely to end up in a, on a ventilator, unlikely to have to go to the hospital and overwhelm the uh, the uh, uh, healthcare system. That would be helpful. Uh, so there's a lot going on that's positive, and I, but I think that the the bottom line is we really de- do need to understand. Who's going to get into trouble with it and who isn't? Now, it's been said so many times over the years that if uh, if we could conquer uh, any virus, then that takes care of the, you know, the, then that's it. I mean, the, the virus question is is answered. But would would you take a. Uh, 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 an antiviral vaccine. I'm talking about you specifically, Whitley. Oh yeah, y- you would do it. Oh sure. Listen, I grew up in the era of polio. Right. When I was a little boy, every summer, some kids did not come back to school because they died of polio or became paralyzed in the summer. And we used to have to be hidden away in our house for weeks during the summertime when I was a little boy. So yeah. When that vaccine, that polio vaccine came out, it changed my life and the life of all my friends. And I have not been interested in the anti-vax movement since then because, you know, I've, I've here probably because of a vaccine. And I just don't, you know, I'm just not concerned about it, frankly. I, I know I listen. I've listened to uh, the Kennedy, young Kennedy fellow who talks about it and all of his arguments. And I have friends who would never go near a vaccine and that's their privilege, but that's not my choice. Yeah. I, I, there's, there's anti-vaxxers and, and when we are talking about, uh, as specifically like the movie Vaxxed, which is a scary movie to watch. Yeah, that's the movie I was. That's what I was referring to. Right, and I've seen that. Yeah, that's a scary movie. It it really makes you question things, especially when it comes to autism and the amount of vaccines that are required and the studies that are behind it that suggest the exact opposite is happening here, which is it's it's a causer of. Of autism and the numbers uh, that are going up exponentially, so 
in autism today, it's it's a scary thing. And then when we flip this over and we're talking about not only the curing of the common cold and coronavirus and uh, and and flus, which kill you know so many people each year, is that something that, you know? If it is indeed safe, is that something that we should all consider? Um, the jury's out for me. I've I've got a I've got a way for the data to come in, and I don't want to be. Uh, how do I say this correctly? I don't want to suggest that I'm an anti-vaxer, but when it comes to autism and and what is played out in the movie Vax, that that's something else altogether, isn't it? We're talking about two different two different types of vaccinations here. Well, all I can say is this: that uh, I've never known in my own life anyone who and was apparently made autistic by by it. So I'm sure people have and. It's tragic when that happens, but I don't know that the. I saw the movie, and I've also read a lot about this whole issue, and I'm not so sure that it's clear that there is a definite connection between vaccines and autism, uh, especially modern vaccines. I mean, God knows what was in what I took the polio vaccine. They didn't know anything about that then, and I, I'm fine. <laughs> um, we all got it, uh, you know. I, yeah, you got it. Probably got it too. Yo, know, I absolutely got it. I went through, yeah. I, you know. And I remember. I've spoken about this enough. Um, I remember uh, being in school. It seemed like every single year, you know, we we got our shots. Right? <laughs> That's it. Yeah. And and we lined up uh, like uh, like cattle. You know, we didn't we didn't question anything. Rolled up our sleeves, got our shots, and went went about our business. Um, and well, you know, in the summer, I had to. I was taken to our country house and and left to stay with the caretaker and his wife when the polio was around. They wouldn't let me even stay at home. Uh, my sister stayed at home because she didn't. She was a little older and she didn't want to be isolated like that. And she got it actually. She didn't get a very bad case of it, thankfully, but she did get it. And some of the children in the neighborhood, were lo- we lost some of them, uh, died. And so it was pretty creepy. Uh, I, I, um, I never forget the summer that I had polio vaccine and didn't have to do that anymore. It was wonderful. Now, Listen, you know, I found this stuff about this special time of night um, the, the, that we were going to talk about earlier, and I couldn't remember it, and I know the listeners are interested. So, Sure. Yeah, let's talk about it now. This is the amazing thing. Back in the 90s, I was meditating with some individuals. It's, it's in, I guess it's in my book. Uh, well, I, I think it's certainly in Supernatural. I, anyway, uh, they were very physical at times, and... Uh, and it's also in uh, solving a communion enigma in more detail. And they would wake me up at three o'clock in the morning to meditate every morning. And they really wanted that. And then we lost the cabin and ran out of money and moved to Texas. And I quit doing it, forgot about it. Then after Annie died, it start, as I said earlier, it started again. And uh, someone on my, I never occurred to me to ask the implant about it. I just assumed it was, quiet and that's why they wanted to do it then and someone on an unknown country in one of the message boards said posted this thing about this time of night that is known as brahma muhartha and i was stunned when i read read this uh here's this uh there's a website called sadhguru dot org s a d h g u r u dot org where you can find information about it it turns out uh that the time the brahma muhartha time is anywhere between 3:30 to 5:30 or 6 a.m. or whatever is the time of sunrise and this is the time when the last quarter of the night when it is possible to become Brahman or creator and make yourself 
the way you want to be, it says here. And it says the nature of the planet's relationship with the sun and moon is such that certain physiological changes happen during in the human system at this time. Medical science has even found that the waste material in your body, such as your urine, for example, has certain qualities at that time which does not have any other time of day. Well, I'm not interested in that. I'm 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 good. Uh, I don't want to <laughs> I want to learn any more about it. But anyway, um, the entire body is in a certain conducive atmosphere, and there is a natural production of melatonin being secreted by the pineal gland, and it is during its maximum during the Brahma Muhurta time, and you can you have your mood is very stable. And uh, you can, it says here, bringing yourself to ease. And it goes on like that. And, you know, I, I've now been doing it literally every night since September of 2015. And if I don't, I don't want an alarm clock. I, I want, as I said earlier, to do it organically. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I want it to be part of me. And, and, and I want it to be part of my engagement with whatever's out there because they will wake me up if I don't wake up. And I want that to happen. I want that engagement if I can get it. Anything I can, any engagement I can get teaches me more every time. So uh, I'm never tired. I'm never tired. Here's my day. I wake up about 6.30 or 7. I usually ride my my bike now indoors, but earlier outdoors. I ride the indoor bike until I've gotten 15 minutes with my heart rate at a certain level, above 115. And then I have my day, and my day lasts um, basically until 11 o'clock at night when I meditate for between half an hour and an hour, do the sensing exercise, depending on how well it's going and how deep I'm getting. I, you know, it depends on I, the longer, the better I do, the better, longer I'll stay. Then I sleep until... About 3.30, 3, 3.30, around in there. I either wake up or they wake me up. I do it, the exercise again for another half hour to an hour. Then I sleep again until 6.30 or 7. And that's my life. And I'm never tired at all. At all. Never. The, uh, the other part about this, now, I've often wondered if, and that includes myself, by the way, Whitley, that if people go through this completely naturally without practicing it and recognize what is going on, but thought that it was just a thing, right? <laughs> you you know, know, that was how I was. That's yeah, what I yeah, thought. yeah. Yeah, I've often wondered that because I've never uh, you know, done a traditional uh, meditation where I went through steps, right? One, two, three, four, five, six... I've never done that, but I've certainly gone into zones that I think are meditative, right? But in yeah. a, it just it completely in a natural way, because people talk about waking up at three thirty all the time, yeah. waking up at four in the morning in these states, and and have often questioned what is going on, including relatives of mine, by the way. But they're not meditators, right? They're not practicing it, but something is happening. Well, the the body wants to engage at this level at that time of day. That's probably probably been happening to people a long time. And these Indian yogis figured it out and made institutionalized it, and then, and they came to understand it is what happened. And it's exciting to me because I've been doing it for so long, and I didn't even know that there was any tradition of it at all. And now I do, which is wonderful. Now, I wanted to uh, get to this also. I know it's it's starting to get a little bit late, but if you want to continue the conversation, uh, we can do it after this next break. But before we get there, I'm going to get this in. Is Has there been any reference from the visitors about uh, a global crowd control situation, that this is something that has been implemented by the dark side for for control, for control of the planet. No, I don't have that in my life. I'm not aware. I mean, I don't, there is no dark side in my life. 
I uh, I wouldn't know what it might or might not be doing or even it exists except inside us. I see the dark side as being fear under another name. And what I experience is often very intense and difficult. But it if I look at it squarely, I always find something of value there, even when it is at its most difficult. And that has been, I've had the worst things that you can have happen in this experience happen to me and my wife. And my choice is to make it mine and make it valuable to me, no matter what. To flip it over. Exactly. 180 so if, degrees. If the dark side comes into my life, it gets flipped over, and I use it for my own benefit, whatever it does and tries. Is that the best? Uh, is that the best that the the media and state actors right now can do? Is implement the fear card like they've been doing for the last three, four months? Well, I think they have no choice people weren't afraid they would not shelter and they and if they don't shelter it's very clear what happens is what happened in italy the whole place practically broke down the whole northern half of italy was riddled with this stuff and and then in spain the same thing happened and here it's happened in pockets like uh, new york city uh it, 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 you know you can't you can't play games with this and I, I think that looking at it politically like that is the really the wrong way to go. It just, it isn't politics. People make it into a political thing. And you can see these things, uh, uh, your, you know, my First Amendment rights are these rights or those rights that people are talking about. The only right that counts is the right to live a peaceful, healthy, and prosperous life. This is what we are looking for, all of us, all over the world, and especially right now. And I, my focus is how do we figure out how to do that fast? And as I said earlier, the key is really very clear. We have to find out who is really vulnerable and be able to identify them. And as far as leaders using this to exert a new level of control, that's going to happen, and it'll fade away, too, sooner or later. I mean, the, the uh, Apple and Google tracking systems will be deployed, and people will use them, and they might or might not be helpful. And Google and Apple will not turn them off, but people will. People will turn them off. I'll turn them off as soon as I can. There's a, you're talking to a person who doesn't even have Wi-Fi. Right. Well, that was, that, so. <laughs> that was my point. That was my point, that there's another benefit of, of this, Whitley, and that is people wanting to connect with you or other programs like this and, and conversations that haven't had the time before. Maybe it's too late at night. They're too busy. Whatever. But now everybody's got time on their hands, and they're also concerned. So have you seen uh, a rise in people reaching out to you for, for information? People reach out to me for strength and calmness because I'm, I'm very much at peace in myself. I, I just am now. I've been through so much in a long lifetime of contending with the often contentious and difficult visitors and the media mockery and all the trolls and uh, well, like example, just perfect example. I I have a computer I've been trying to sell. I tried to sell it on eBay. I made the mistake of putting up on my Facebook page that it was for sale. And so what happens? A guy comes along and bids out everybody else, and then doesn't pay for the specific purpose of sabotaging me. And that is my life. Do, am I disappointed? Yeah, I would like to sell the computer, but am I surprised? No. Am I angry and eaten up by it? Not at all. Not anymore. 
I just roll along with the waves. <laughs> roll along. <laughs> I picture, uh, and I've, I've I've tried to uh, project this uh, on this show that I walk around in in the zenest state that I can. I just yeah. I just live my well, life what's that the way. Point of living. Otherwise, if you don't, that's right. Have that have access to joy. No, you have to. You have to. You have you to. You have to find your place in joy. That's the whole. There's no other reason to be alive. So I know people. I know people who are rich and just concentrate on getting richer and richer and richer. And I said to one of them, I said to one guy, he's a multi-billionaire. Of course, he doesn't think to help other people like this poor guy. Mm -hmm. And uh, but you know, it, people always say, well, why doesn't so and so help you? I said, he's not a billionaire because he's generous. Okay, and that that the, the Bill Gateses are few and far between in this world. So, um, but what's the point? Once you have enough, what does more mean? It reminds we need, we're here to have a joyous life, not to, not to do things like that. It reminds me of Ted Knight in uh, Caddyshack. You know, he's the rich judge. Small. Yeah, I remember. I love that movie. Yeah, so when, when Ted Knight goes, the world needs ditch diggers, too. <laughs> right? Yeah, well, right. It's <laughs> such a classic scene. Uh, can I get you to hang on and continue the conversation? How long, Jimmy? I, three hours, Whitley. You're not. You're going to go from this show straight into meditation. How's that? Yeah, oh God! Well, look, Jimmy. <laughs> I'll I'll see if I can do it. But I, I I I'll go for another half hour. But I'm having sitting here, frank, frankly, in a room that's like an oven because <laughs> I have no. It, it's not air conditioned, and I can't open the windows. It'll annoy my voice. Will annoy the neighbors. Exactly. Uh, yeah, twenty minutes. And uh, and we'll call it a night. But thank you so okay. much, Whitley. Another great conversation. Stay right there, everybody. We're going to go do some overtime with Whitley Strieber. This is Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. He thought I was serious about the three hours, by the way. Let's uh, take a quick break, and we'll be right back. Follow me on Twitter at Radio, And you can follow Whitley on Twitter at Whitley Strieber. We've got it all right up in our feed. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back, Fade to Black. Our guest tonight, Whitley Strieber. We're going to go straight into some overtime. I want to remind everybody what's going on this week. Tomorrow night, Johnny Enoch joins the show. Wednesday night, Nick Redfern is here. He's got a new book out on Rendlesham. And then, of course, Thursday night is Fader Night with open lines all night long. And back to Whitley. But, Whitley, I'm going to change course. I'm going to change course and catch you by surprise. A week ago today, a week ago, uh, the United States Navy and the Pentagon announced the official release of those three UFO slash UAP videos. The media uh, grabbed onto the story and uh, tried to make it viral, but the response from the rest of the world uh, seemed to be very muted. And I, I'm not sure why. Did that surprise you? Not at all. Uh their response was muted for a lot of reasons. Here's one of them is that people were not exactly surprised because they, the, you know, anyone could see that there was something very strange going on. You hear the voices of those pilots and you know, that's true. And it's obviously not something of ours, no matter what anyone says, because this would be a different world if we had technology like that, even if it was held secret. Because that technology is, that's anti-gravity technology. And if we had anti-gravity devices that were secret, they would be like all other secret stuff. If you looked back in the literature 
10 years, five years, you would see the beginnings of this just as you can if you looked back in the literature of stealth aircraft years ago when they were very secret. You could see in the literature, the non-classified literature, where that technology was coming from. I know because I did that. And uh, and that was before any of this visitor stuff happened because I was interested in that and I was writing thrillers at the time and I thought I could maybe make a a thriller out of that. In any case, I I didn't, but uh, in fact, that's the case. There's nothing like that. There's nothing anywhere about anything like that, which means it's not ours. So people weren't, ex- you know, it was it was a, it was a sort of a ho hum. Yeah, they finally admitted what's obvious. But I've got a few questions here. What's that? My first here's my first question: Why in the world does the Navy first say that this they cannot release any more of these files because it involves a that would involve a grave threat? to our national security. Then a few weeks later, they say, oh, but this one is definitely an unknown. Mm -hmm. Where are they coming from? Are they schizophrenics now also? And what about the U.S. Air Force? It's dead silent. But they've got to have similar video. Of course they do. I'll tell you why it's dead silent. And this is the kind of thing that we need to figure out how to fix. It is dead silent because its mission is to protect the United States from threats from above. And it can't do it in this case. And I've heard UFO investigators say, but there's no threat. Well, I'm sorry. Come into my bedroom on December the 26th, 1985, and I will show you a threat that they could not protect me from. And... To their everlasting shame, they never warned any of us about this possibility. So when this comes to you in the night, you have no way at all of expecting it or knowing what to do, if anything. The reason is, there's nothing we can do. There's nothing they can do. They can't protect us from this. So what is their mission? Well, their mission has to be to protect us from the Chinese and the Russians and people like that that they can protect us from, and they do a very good job of that, and more power to them. They need to admit the fact that this is an unknown and we can't do a darn thing about it. They all do. That's where this needs to go. And when it goes down that road, then the public's going to be interested again. Now, why is it, Whitley, and I know that you've uh, thought about this, that, and it's probably pretty close to 50-50, in that anybody that sees these videos is divided into two groups, probably 50-50, in that the one side doesn't see anything extraterrestrial or strange about the videos, and then you've got the other group immediately, without a gray area in the middle, uh, that see nothing but uh, something strange and quite possibly off-planet, and for them there's no question about what they are seeing. How can it be such a divide when we're all seeing the same videos? Well, it's because people think differently and their minds work differently. Uh, As far as this is concerned, they're called the grays for a reason, I think. It is because this is all a gray area. Uh, we, we, <laughs> well, done. these things could be from off planet or they could be from here in some way that we don't understand. And a little while ago, we were talking about a parallel universe that, that exists right here. Maybe that's where they're from. Uh, the, I mean, th- this is so complicated. The beauty of all of this is, and the fun of it is, it just gets weirder and weirder and weirder. The closer you look at it, the deeper you get into it, the more you know about it, the more you know the visitors. And as I say, I live with them now. They're my life. I I would be terribly lonely if I did not have them in my life. They're incredibly valuable companions now. But what are they? (laughs) You have no idea. I just live with it. 
And we have to do the same thing with this whole thing. And and maybe maybe they're gonna maybe they're gonna suck me up in the end and eat me for lunch. I don't have any idea, but not now. It hasn't happened today, and so I'm still going. Um, where will this go? Well, probably the Navy hopes it'll go away. And you have this strange, I mean, I found it, find it quite strange, this group TTSA, which is a group of uh, intelligence officers, basically, some of whom I know and are lovely people. I've known one of them, Hal Pudoff, for most of my adult life, and he's a marvelous, brilliant man. One of the and one of the sweetest, nicest people I've ever met. On the one hand, and on the other hand, he's also the most expert secret keeper I've ever met in my life. He's just a master of it, and he knows a lot of secrets. But people are uneasy, you know, when they see these people's credentials. The credentials are impressive, but then they think, "Well, wait a minute. This is the intelligence community, and they've got a rock and roller." as their front man to, to, to attract the attention of the media, it all looks like some kind of a setup, mm-hmm. frankly. Mm-hmm. It's not organic. Like the people in the, in the uh, Close Encounter experience, it's totally organic. We don't have any intelligence officers uh, running the puppet strings from the background or anything. And I'm not saying they're necessarily doing a bad job. I think Hal's a great guy, and I think he's probably doing a great job. But the public is not at ease with a situation like that. They feel that they can't tell whether or not the stories are being manipulated for reasons that are not being explained. I guess that's where I think they come from, and that's why they're a little cool on this, a little hesitant about it. There's not the enthusiasm for it that you'd think there would be, because it's, after all, looks like it's increasingly every day, like it's about contact, for God's sakes. Wonderful. What an extraordinary thing. Do you unless think... Well, yeah, go ahead. This is... Unless that, that great... I believe it's an Outer Limits show, where it's a, it turns out that the, 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 the Book of Man is a cookbook, <laughs> remember that? <laughs> I do remember that actually. I do yeah, remember that. It's in, it's also in one of the one of those movies. Oh God, I forget a very funny movie that um, that plays on that. But anyway, I don't think it's a cookbook, and I don't think they're here to invade us because the visitors, as I understand and know them, I've seen some of their skills. If they were here to invade us, that would have happened in about three seconds. And it it didn't. They're here for other reasons. Do you think that and even I, with uh, TTSA's staff, you know, like you just suggested, I mean, it's rather obvious uh, when you can go and see everybody's CVs and credentials uh, where they come from, uh, different yeah. agencies inside of Washington, that now it's uh, it's two and a half, almost three years since the revelations of uh, December of 2017, no new uh, information has come forward from TTSA with all of the connections that were there. Do you think that they've dried up, that they've been cut off from access to anything coming out of the Pentagon? Because we're still looking at the same three videos. You know, that would be a guess, and I think probably a good guess because we have three videos. This has been going on for 70 years. I've got videos just as good uh, that are, uh, there's one of them from uh, Puerto Rico. Yep. I agree. That that is every bit as good as the TTSA videos. It was taken by a plane um, uh, that was following this thing and, you know, with an automatic camera. And there are others as well. And, you know, I, I, I sent that video to one of these guys. I'm not going to say which one, but to one of them, the Puerto Rico video. And he sent me back an email saying, well, we know all about this. We watched it. We saw it submerge. We know how fast it's going. And he told me all the details of it's at 1,400 feet and going some hundred miles an hour or something. I don't know what... And he said, then, it's not 
an unknown. We know what it is. And I thought, okay, what is it? That email didn't get answered. (laughs) And it's not ours, but they know what it is. So why do they tell us? Why don't they tell us? Yeah, and I would say uh, my response to that, and I, I spoke about this the other night on, on, on Coast as well. I've talked about the Puerto Rico video quite a bit. My response to that is, uh, A, uh, TTSA had nothing to do with that video or its release. Therefore, it's not part of their program, number one. Number two... Um, the other part about the Puerto Rico video is I think that the evidence in that video is much more compelling than the three videos released by TTSA. And it, it just got lost in the chatter over the last couple of years. It or should be buried in the chatter. Yeah, or buried in the chatter. And it should be as researched and talked about who who is the crew on the plane. What were they saying? You know, bring those guys forward and gals, and and let's find out uh, more information about it. And it should be as researched and discussed and out there in the media, uh, just like those other three videos. And it's not, and I can't explain why. Well, it's because somebody doesn't want it to be. Simple as that. Simple as that. And why not? I, You know, I've always had the sense that if there are aliens here, they might be in control of the degree to which their presence is being revealed. In fact, I would assume they would be in control of that, that it's not us, it's them. And, you know, there was an article in uh, the magazine Science in April of 1977 by two physicists, D.B.H. Kuiper and Mark Morris, And they expressed the thought that if aliens came here, the only thing they would want from us was whatever we had that they did not know. And that wouldn't be much. (laughs) But one thing that would be very clear is if they revealed themselves, then all of our cultural direction would be turned toward them and whatever newness and innovation we had to offer would just disappear. So they would have a motive for keeping themselves hidden and they might very well be compelling our governments to keep the the lid on. And they might not be doing that by sitting down across a table from them. I know these people well, a lot of them, and I can assure you they have things like the control of the human mind down pat. Mm -hmm. And I learned it took a long time to get a battle almost to get to the point where I'm free of that. But somebody who doesn't know it exists is going to be dancing to their tune and not even know it. And that, I can assure you, is going to happen in the intelligence community because most of these people are very, they're very self-assured and they think they know what they're doing. Ideal, an ideal field of fire for someone who wants to control their thoughts. That Twilight Zone episode was to serve man. To serve man. That's right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that wasn't me. That was Shanna, one of the Fader Knots, tweeted that out. That's why I love this audience. They make you and I look smart. Oh, it's such a fun audience. I love you guys, <laughs> by the way. It's always fun to be on Fade to Black, and you're a big part of the reason. Yeah, thank you for that, Whitley, and, and you know, much respect. And, and you know, look, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say this. I spent so much time over the years listening to – your conversations and your presentations over on Dreamland, and and I learned so much. And your ability, and then we're going to move on. I want to make another comment. But your ability to engage in a conversation with a guest or a friend on Dreamland was uh, it, it, it's a lesson in in conversation in how to do that naturally. And, yeah. and if, if I can, Good, con- thanks. well, if I can convey just a small 
piece of that, then I win. So hopefully I I, I learned something. You're pretty good at it too, Jimmy. It's <laughs> always fun to be here. You know what you're doing. Well, I appreciate that. Now going, I'm going to go back to the uh, the Puerto Rico video, by the way, because you and I have not discussed it, uh, and certainly prior to this show. Um, I did make a point of bringing it up last week and on Coast to Coast over the weekend. And the reason for that uh, is this. What I see in the three TTSA videos or any other video, it, 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 it simply doesn't matter. My opinion doesn't matter. But I'll say this. The Puerto Rico video, when I watch that, it's one of the rare instances where I'm able to sit back and go, WTF, right? That I can't resolve in my mind. There is something in this video. And that that's what I get out of the Puerto Rico video. And I'm just surprised that it, it, it hasn't grabbed hold of this community and the rest of the world because there's something astounding and remarkable about that video. Yeah, that's for sure. Uh, it, it is. And, uh, it, you know, it's a, let me see if I can find this email I'll read out what this guy wrote me. Um, it, it, but while I'm looking for that, uh, it, it's a, it's a video that, um, that is, it's, you know, it's, it was, it, someone, someone put it out there on purpose. It wasn't, it was not classified because it was, I believe it was a Homeland Security plane or something. Yeah, I'll it, tell it, you how. I'll, I'll tell you how it broke. It was uh, through Joshua P. Warren, and he, you know, he lived in Puerto Rico, and he got the video from uh, someone in Puerto Rico, and then on Fade to Black, and I believe it was two years ago, on Fade to Black, revealed that video, and we did it here. And I thought, uh, Whitley, at the time, I thought, man, this is this is it, right? This is it. This is the Holy Grail, and it just yeah. it, it just didn't take off. Oh, no pun intended, by the way. But I I thought it was it was uh, shocking to see, and I think anybody that sees it agrees. Whoa, this is this is incredible. But but the media just uh, decided to ignore it. Okay, did you find the email? Yes. Uh, okay. I sent it, sent him an email saying, this is a physical object. The video was made by an automatic surveillance camera in Puerto Rico some years ago. He replies, true, not a tic-tac, slow, 60 knots, no odd behaviors. Photograph from a Department of Homeland Security, single-engine prop aircraft. Camera features auto-following. I recall the speed between being between 40 and 70 miles an hour, depending on where you are in the video. Uh, also reported by DHS as 60 knots when an object appeared to enter water and reemerge, which it did, was explained. Was a classified USO not odd in any way to alt physics? Wait a minute. Not in any way related to Tic Tacs or, or, for, or either the Nimitz or the Roosevelt on Atlantic Coast later in 2014. Classified USO? Yeah. It does not mean that it is ours. It's a very cleverly worded thing. Hmm. It means that they know what it is, not that it is ours. Hmm. See, that's fascinating. Hmm. Fascinating. Hmm. I don't have words right now. That's yeah. a that's a very interesting response, and obviously, I know who this person is. I don't know who wrote it. But no, if I you if don't know was... this person, he's not in. He's not a TTSA person. Oh, I thought he was. Okay. Oh no, 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 not at all. He's he's in an entirely different area, and you would never. And he's a personal friend of mine. It has been for many years. Okay. And, uh, so it, it's uh, it's very interesting uh, on every level. They yeah, they know he what they not ob- say anything that there that's classified. Nor did. Uh, I repeat anything that's classified. I don't even know anything that's classified about that. Would you interpret this? The USO is a, a interesting term to use. Um, yeah. Are you are you are you confident in? The, uh, am I seeing or hearing 
UAP, that this is like an unidentified aerial phenomenon? It's an or, underwater yeah, well, USO uh, undersurface was object or something, I, I guess. Right. Um, but it's uh, but it, it non odd in any way to alt physics is code for saying we know what it is in in exotic the world of exotic physics. But right. That doesn't necessarily mean it's ours. Very interesting. And thank you for that. Thank you for uh, looking that up, Whitley. What a great conversation tonight. Uh, it is just awesome every time you're on the show with us. But really quick for everybody, um, how uh, often do you put out Dreamland, and where can everybody go to subscribe? Okay, there's lots of ways to do this. First of all, Dreamland is free and subscription. If you get the free Listen to it free. You can listen to it in a lot of places, including on KGRA on Saturday nights, uh, Paranormal Radio app, uh, Alexa, uh, Apple Podcasts, TuneIn Radio, lots of places. And you will hear the commercials. And when you do hear the commercials, I am now exerting mind control, and you will do what you are told <laughs> by my commercials. <laughs> anyway, they're all commercials for the site. We don't take outside advertising. And um, or for my books and whatnot. And uh, th this week we have a great show. We have two close encounter witnesses that were mentioned in Preston Dennett's book uh, that, that he he published very recently about onboard UFO encounters. We had him last week, and now two of the witnesses this week, and they will be with us in the subscriber chat room on Wednesday night. The site's very active. It has a free message board for anyone who doesn't want to pay or can't pay. Because one of the things I learned very early on from the visitors when I, when I was going to, Annie and I knew what we would be doing with this, was that as much of it as possible had to be free. Mm -hmm. So it is. Mm -hmm. But that also means that people who have a sense of understanding the importance of all of this need to go over there and subscribe. Uh, it's four ninety five a month, and there's lots of different ways to subscribe. You can do PayPal or a credit card or anything. We do not. Uh, we are easy to handle when it comes. If you want to quit, you know, you can get your your money back usually for the last month you paid, etc. and so forth. And uh, when people if people can't afford it, they can always ask and get a free month free subscription if they want. So awesome. Whitley, uh, keep doing your thing, man, and uh, you're just uh, a treasure and a resource well, for this community you. and for the world. And and you know I mean that, but thank you so much. Thank you. Whitley Streber. And Whitley's links, again, are over at JimmyChurchRadio.com. And there you have it. We just went through overtime, poll to poll, a straight two and a half hours with Whitley Streber. Thank you so much, Whitley. Fade to Black's executive producer. I'm going to go straight into credits right now. Fade to Black's executive producer is Rita Camarion. Show is produced by Hill J. Palm, Renee Dennis, and Kevin. Announcers are Steve Harder, Gene Vitoa, Mark D. Kovar. Webmaster is Drew the Geek. Music, Doug Aldrich. Intro, Space Boy, SpaceboyMusic.com. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Game Changer Network, and syndication is KGRA, The Planet. This broadcast only copyrighted 2020 by Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network, Inc. It cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black or the Game Changer Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Tomorrow night, right here, Johnny Enoch. Very special thanks to Whitley Streber. Until tomorrow night, I want everybody to be safe. Go Beckley Tappy.